Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Additional funding provided by Idaho National Laboratory, where for 60 years the energy of innovation has lighted the way to progress in energy and national security, basic and applied science and engineering technology, and the education of Idaho's next generation of researchers. Idaho's universities conduct some amazing scientific research. This week the governor noted the economic benefit of all that work with his iGEM proposal. We'll talk about that, get more details on what's happening on the cutting edge, and take your calls. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. In his State of the State address, Governor Butch Otter called for $5 million for the Idaho Global Entrepreneurial Mission, or iGEM. The iGEM initiative would invest in research at Idaho's universities and aid those efforts to turn those research projects into jobs and businesses. So what kind of research is actually going on? Joining me now to highlight some of the state's cutting edge investigations and to talk about the importance of STEM education, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, our three guests in our Moscow studio is Jack McIver, Vice President for Research and Economic Development for the University of Idaho. Sir, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And in our Boise studio is Richard Jacobson, Executive Director of Research and Technology Transfer for Idaho State University. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And Mark Rudin, Vice President of Research for Boise State University. Sir, thank you for being here. Thank I appreciate you for it. Having me. And of course, we want to hear from you. Give us a call toll free at 1 800 973 9800. So let's go ahead and just dive into some of the research project. Mark, let's talk about what's going on at BSU. One of the projects you want to talk about deals with nanotechnology. What is that? Yes, uh, DNA nanotechnology. Uh, you know, most of us are familiar with DNA as being genetic material that you know can determine the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, and so forth. But pe what people may not know is that DNA can be used as a building material. And uh, you know, DNA can be assembled from bare bones, almost like a Lego set, for particular purposes and, purposes and very precise formations and so forth. And people can use those precise formations for various applications, such as uh, microprocessors and computers, but also for uh, disease detection. And, th and that's exactly what we're trying to do over at Boise State. Uh, we received a $1 million uh, grant from the WM Keck Foundation uh, over in our material science uh, group at, at Boise State. And the, the grant is used to support a portable, inexpensive detector, uh, a blood test uh, for disease and particularly for cancer for early detection in cancer. And the, the uh, principal investigator jokingly uh, uh, terms it as it, it's analogous to a, a pregnancy test, a disposable pregnancy test. <laughs> and what happens is that uh, uh, you can use the DNA for the detector and the detector uh, uh, can be used and, and plated on, onto the surface of this detector. Uh, the DNA can be plated on the surface of the detector. And uh, there are different types of proteins and molecules that, that are in the, in the person's uh, circulatory system uh, referred to as microRNAs. And these microRNAs are, are present when there's either, uh, uh, are, and are seen when there's either tumor progression or tumor suppression. But regardless, they're there when there is, are tumors there. And so you can do, uh, take a sample of blood, put it on this detector, and uh, immediately shows as a positive or negative test. And you can, you can detect the presence of cancers very that's early that's in the process. Problem. That's, that's incredible. It, it really is. It, it's, uh, it's one of those things where you walk into those, those labs and you see the faculty and students working on that. And you just, you know, we, we have uh, VIPs that come on campus and we, we make no bones about it. We show them that lab and they're just amazed at the high, high tech, cutting edge um, research that's going on. And, and in fact, the uh, Keck Award that we received, the, one of the requirements of the Keck uh, Foundation Award is uh, high risk, high reward. Uh, type of research, and, and that's what they're getting in this particular research project. Well, Jack, let's move up, up to I, up to U of I. What research is going on there? You're talking about 
that's a phrase that it may be new, new to me, bioinformatics, is that right? Yes, and thank you, Mark. That was a great introduction. <laughs> uh, let me really pose a general problem that uh, one looks at in bioinformatics in a companion study, which is the evolutionary studies. And that is, we're in an arms race. If we think of ourselves as humans, we have various parasites, viruses. Good example is the flu. Every year we find out that there's a new strain of flu that's moving through. We need a new vaccine. Uh, the flu changes, the virus changes. It's not only true, though, of humans, but it's also of plants and animals. We read, for instance, that weeds are becoming resistant to the pesticides we're using. This is an evolutionary process. We're trying to understand what it is that's changing and how it's changing. We do this by working with a large number of people. Uh, these involve students and faculty. I'm not going to highlight one in particular. And a lot of specialized equipment. Mark talked about the equipment that they're developing. We have rapid genome sequencers. Um, we have a lot of field studies through our agricultural people and a lot of work. But what this generates is a large amount of data. And the bioinformatics is the question of how do we use the mathematicians, the computer sciences, and the statisticians to find out what's going on. And so what we're looking at is as we do these laboratory studies, we find out that the next flu virus is a little bit different than the one before. It takes a lot of laboratory work to do that. If one can develop models, understand the types of processes that are going on through images, through genome sequencing, and so on, ultimately we hope that we can come up with models. So instead of having to run continuous laboratory tests, which are expensive, we can have a model. It simply tells us certain things are likely to happen. Do we care? Of course. We would like to understand better. What is the next flu virus? How do we make weeds? Or how do we make pesticides that actually kill the weeds and not the weeds thrive on it at the same time as the wheat? Well, how do we take advantage of the fact that the climate changes? And we what, want wheat that will grow when it's wet. And we'll or talk dry, a bit more about your climate change. And we'll talk more about your climate change in just a minute. I want to get to what's going on at ISU. You're also on this. Right. Is all, you're also looking at this microscopic scale of stuff with medical isotopes and nuclear research. Uh, Idaho State University has a relatively long history in research in nuclear science and engineering and in uh, the health professions. And we use a nuclear accelerator, which is an apparatus uh, that's uh, set up to produce beams of high energy charged particles and direct them against various targets. Uh, these machines, sometimes called atom smashers, uh, are used to observe objects uh, as small as the atomic nucleus uh, in studies of, their, of its structures and of the forces that hold it together. And accelerators can also be used to provide high energy, uh, uh, large amounts of energy to create new isotopes or new particles. Accelerators have practical applications in medicine and industry, but particularly in the production of radioisotopes. Medical isotopes are very small quantities of radioactive substances that are used both for imaging and for treatment of diseases. And 80 to 85 percent of the nuclear medicine procedures worldwide use a medical isotope, molybdenum-99, technetium-99, and about 20 million procedures were done in the United States in the year 2009 using mostly imported medical isotopes that were produced in a reactor, a can-do reactor, it's called, in Ontario, Canada. And that reactor is nearing the end of its useful life. Uh, the United States imports 90 percent or more of the medical isotopes it uses. So this research helps produce for the, for, the, for the U.S. market? It does. So, so we're not having to, to import it. And using nuclear accelerators to produce medical isotopes is considered a good alternative to producing isotopes in a reactor. And there are fewer potential issues because the accelerator doesn't use enriched uranium and it also doesn't involve the generation of nuclear waste. ISU's accelerator center uh, is at the forefront 
of research that's focused on developing unique ways of, of producing medical isotopes. Well, there's a company called International Isotopes Incorporated. They're a manufacturer of nuclear medicine products. And they've just completed an agreement with Idaho State University to jointly develop processes for the production of a new promising medical isotope, copper 67, for the treatment of serious cancers. And it hasn't been consistently available in the U.S. to date. So this is another opportunity for ISU to uh, contribute to that uh, availability. And so that this is what the governor was, is the iGEMS proposal is supposed to do. It's supposed to fund the research and then find ways of moving that technology so that it can be used by industry creating jobs. I that's, think so. That's the general. I think that's the, the main focus. Additional nuclear energy research is being conducted by Dr. Eric Burgett at the new Idaho Joint Research Complex, and that was formerly called the Ballard Medical <laughs> Building. Well, let me, was, let me jump in a question before sure. you move on to that. I'm, uh, that how important is it to, to have that additional bump from the iGEMS project? What? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm incredibly supportive of the governor's iGEM initiative. You know, it really does represent uh, government, university, and industry coming together, leveraging talent, resources, time, energy to develop products and, and really energize and create an economic vitality within the state. And Jack, what kind, you, you talked a lot about students getting involved in this. How, how, what kind of research are undergraduates, say, students getting involved with on campus? They're getting involved in a wide range of research. Uh, we have uh, undergraduate students. In fact, uh, freshman to sophomore year, we had a slew of them in the laboratory doing genome sequencing. We have a program, actually, where we have high school students helping with our fish research in Hagerman. Uh, and it extends, of course, all the way up. There are lots of opportunities. In fact, we encourage it. We found that retention, students are much more likely to stay in school, go on to graduate school, work in the professions if they have that research experience. They're a key part of our workforce in research. Yeah, uh, Joan, you know, at, at Boise State, we, we've experienced a tremendous amount of growth in both the volume and sophistication of the research over the last couple of years. And it's due to a number of reasons and, you know, a very talented faculty and, and staff and so forth. But students have been and remain uh, a centerpiece and a, a great contributors to the research that we do here at the university, uh, both at the undergraduate level and graduate level. And even though we've experienced and, and continue to grow in, in graduate programming, uh, we will never lose sight of the importance of the undergraduate in that research activity. So, And I assume the same is true at ISU, that students play an active role in the research. Well, the way I always try to explain it to people is our business is education. And research is part of the process. It's sort of a higher form of teaching, if you want to look at it that way, because the research provides the opportunity for graduate students to do theses and dissertations, which help them to complete their degrees. And without that quality research, the graduate program is either weak or non-existent. So I think it's a very important part of what we do. And you asked about the governor's uh, the iGEM proposal? iGEM proposal. One of the places where we run out of money in almost all the work is at the end of the research contract, the universities don't have uh, very much money that's actually available for the commercialization or for the development that leads to the commercialization of, of products. You can think of it in various ways, but the state generally hasn't paid for that kind of activity in any of the universities. And there are a lot of reasons for it, but uh, it's, it's a very important thing now to think about how we're going to do that if we're going to grow and increase the commercialization of, of the highest quality university research in the state. Well, from coming from your side of state, we have found an example of where research is being turned into a practical application and hence jobs. Uh, era, uh, scientists now are turning the research done to help make a difference with the environment. One scientist in Blackfoot recently proved microbes could be used to solve the growing problem of what to do with household waste. Uh, Aaron Coons from EarthFix has provided us with a report. Let's take a look at that. 
Here in the mountains in eastern Idaho, near the city of Blackfoot, you'll find Rattlesnake Canyon landfill in Bingham County. Tons of trash is dumped, buried, and left to slowly become part of the landscape. Rick Lindstrom is the manager at Rattlesnake Canyon. He has watched the landfill grow over the years. And we started from just a, a, a maybe a, a fourth of what you see now to, to where it is. And it's, uh, yeah, it's grown a lot. Rattlesnake Canyon landfill has grown to over 420 acres. Lindstrom says this land could be described as prime real estate or a place to enjoy the pristine view of the mountains. But today, it's one of several growing landfills in Bingham County. Sadly, Lindstrom says not everything that is dumped here is trash. The majority of it, I'd say between 60 to 75 percent of it is recyclable. Most of we, what we get is uh, wood, uh, wooden papers, which can be used as compost material. That's why Lindstrom and the county he works for decided to work with Ted Carpenter, a scientist that wants to turn trash into earth. People call municipal solid waste. I call it landfill material because I don't consider it waste. I consider it a resource. Microbes are bacteria that utilize carbon-based material as food. It's a process most are familiar with and some even use. Composting utilizes food waste and over time turns the waste into nutrient-rich soil. But Carpenter's method speeds up the composting process and allows it to not only work faster but can break down even more household materials. We stimulate the microorganisms in a proprietary way, in a two-step process, and that is unique, and the results are unique. Carpenter claims his process is unique because it breaks down wood, plastics, and styrofoam cups in just 10 weeks. After testing his microbe technology on these materials, Carpenter upped the ante by introducing other materials. Five gallons of diesel fuel, three gallons of gasoline, several quarts of motor oil, along with antifreeze, pesticides, and carcinogenic compound methylene chloride. He showed us the old test rows he used to get rid of carcinogens and the pesticides declared unsafe for humans. Oh, smells so good. They're harmless. I can grow carrots a foot and a half long in the, in the material. The carrot grows perfectly fine. In 10 weeks, the harmful compounds are gone. It's not magic, says Carpenter, it's science. The microbes convert the harmful compounds into something useful. By using extremely hot temperatures over the 10-week process, in some cases as much as 180 degrees, it also kills all human pathogen species like E. coli and salmonella. Then as a consortium, as a, as a team, they work together to disassemble these compounds until they're gone. The initial test was conducted between September and December of 2010. The Idaho Department of Environmental Quality closely monitored the test by Ted Carpenter. The agency concluded that the microbial process posed little to no harm or risk to human health and also took care of the toxic chemicals added to the windrows. Lindstrom says it has the potential to make a 50-year landfill and turn it into a 100 or even 200-year landfill. For Dialogue, I'm Erin Coons. So that's an example of a project. Science started it and has a very practical application. Is that something that, that you strive for when you're setting up a research project at one of the universities? Yes, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, we're always looking at opportunities to partner with industry and partner with federal agencies and state agencies and so forth to get products out the door and, and get them commercialized. But, you know, I, it, you also have to realize that that, the, that engine really starts with basic research. And, you know, you need to get the funding and, and conduct the research to generate those ideas. And, and so it's, a, it's kind of a pipeline from basic research through applied research to commercialization. Well, you each have one more project, so let's make one more state. Let's start with you. Your, pro your second project you want to tell us a little bit about from ISU is on social dynamics and the environment. Talk about that. Led by Dr. Herb Mashner, who's a research professor of anthropology and the director of the Idaho Museum of Natural History. The Sanak Biocomplexity Project is a study of an ancient Aleut culture on the Alaskan Peninsula. And the Aleuts survived by harvesting and distributing salmon, cod, crab, halibut, uh, other seafoods. And with changes in the global economy, especially the in, growth in uh, cheap farmed salmon from Norway and Chile uh, and elsewhere, the, the politics of environmental conservation 
um, like restrictions on fishing mm -hmm. um, so that they protect endangered species. Their traditions and, and their culture itself are, is being threatened. And in an effort to preserve their way of life, the Aleut are turning to archaeology and anthropology to recapture their, uh, their roots, their historical identity. And Dr. Mashner's project includes uh, archaeologists, ecologists, social anthropologists, geologists, oceanographers, uh, a wide range of, of people who are seeking to understand the role of the ancient and, and the modern uh, Aleut local and, and regional ecosystems. So one research team, for example, is uh, evaluating Alaskan salmon populations in the southern Bering Sea and in the North Pacific, uh, the central part of the North Pacific, as well as in rivers and, and streams in Alaska. And they're developing models and simulations built on various data and trying to determine the, the uh, behavior. So the information that they gather includes archaeological data from 5,000 years ago, as well as modern catch data from uh, commercial fisheries. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're running out of time, so I wanna make sure we get through the other two projects. Jack, yep. what's, you, yours, uh, your second project is on, deals with climate variability, climate change. Actually, yes, it is really a look at the mitigation and adaptation that we're going to have to understand and implement as we go to the future. For example, if we look at the Palouse region of the Northwest, 13% of the nation's wheat comes from this region. If this is no longer productive or it changes significantly, we're gonna have a food problem. And this is really a collaboration. I want to acknowledge the work that Idaho State and Boise State, as well as our partners across the Northwest, are working on this. This is a series of projects. It involves measurements of the forests. It involves measurements of the snowpack and the water runoff. It is laboratory-based, related to the bioinformatics. It is how our adaptions occurring. How much adaptation do we have to have? How do we understand as we move forward? How do we develop new wheat varieties, which we've been doing for a number of years? How do we develop the fish vaccines that we need? How do we make sure that the fish themselves will be working in the future. It involves a lot of hard work. It has a number of laboratories. We have measurements going on in the Arctic and Antarctic, and we also have them in the region. It involves scientists from a wide range of areas. Again, it's the people that you'd expect. It's the biologists and the ecologists. But to follow up on what uh, Dr. Jacobson was saying, it involves the social sciences. We are trying to maintain a quality of life. We're trying to provide for a sustainable future, and it's a very complex process. So as we move forward, we are not only doing the science, we're looking to the future, we're trying to understand the ways that we can best move forward and feed the world as the population grows and the things that go with it. So we appreciate the collaborations we have with the other universities, we'll continue to work with the other universities and at the same time, we're going to have to come up with new modes of collaboration. I think this is a project where it's very complex. We don't understand all of the issues that we have to deal with. We certainly don't understand the climate variability right now. But we have to be looking to the future. And so as we do this, we are facing a number of new issues that were not uh, thought of, certainly in my scientific career. That is the amount of data that we collect. What can we learn? How do we bring all these people together? And how do we look to the future and be successful? It's, it's that challenge of finding the chaos, the chaos of data, finding the bigger picture. In that. Now, you, now BSU has a project on the geosciences, so that's... Yes, yes, we do. Uh, you know, Boise State is home to one of the largest groups of academic geophysicists in the world, uh, and probably in the nation and pretty much in the world. Um, and their research is focused primarily or exclusively on the shallow subsurface, which is defined as the first thousand feet underground. And, you know, you could ask, what do geophysicists do? And uh, just give you a quick scenario. Let's say there's a, a, a gasoline truck down, driving down the road, overturns and spills into an adjacent field. And, you know, the question you have to ask yourself, will, will that gasoline that spills off in the field, will it impact public water supplies? 
you know, and without it, without looking, being able to look into the ground, where is the gasoline heading? How deep did it go? What direction did it head? And so forth. And that's where that's where uh, geophysicists come in. They can look underground without actually digging into the ground with instrumentation and and collect data that can help with those types of remedial efforts. And specifically, the investigators at Boise State are developing sensing technologies that along with computer codes can develop a 3D picture of these type of plumes underneath the ground to better guide remedial efforts. And uh, you know, Boise State is also home to the uh, uh, Boise Hydrogeophysical Research Site, which is in the southeast Boise, right along the Boise River. That is a unique field laboratory that is used from uh, folks from across the world, from Switzerland and Italy. And, but the beauty of it is that it also supports the educational and research opportunities of the geoscience students at, at Boise State. And the, the great thing about that is it's a very well characterized field, meaning we know what's under the ground uh, under that site. And folks from across the world can bring their instrumentation and take field measurements and validate that information and, and what, the, what the ground looks like uh, underneath. It's, so. you know, I, Jack, you said something. This is, these are science that when you first started in these fields, gentlemen, they didn't exist or the technology didn't exist or it's all new and changing. How do you keep up with science and technology as it continues to expand and advance? Other than money, I guess. Money is the key in that one <laughs> to keep up with yeah. it. Uh, go, Jack, ahead, go ahead, It is certainly, I was going to say, it's certainly, money, of course, is certainly an important part, but we have to realize that the student is changing too. Those things that we didn't grow up with are now common. Yeah. The computer, yeah. which is new. Uh, it's the students, I think, to a large extent. It's the bright young faculty that have the ideas, different ways of doing it. But to a large extent, it's a two-way street. The student teaches as much as the student okay. learns. Yeah. And so yeah. the student comes in with more technology, more knowledge, better ways of looking at things. Uh, we hear things, the communications that we didn't have before through the internet, for instance, and the wealth of information that we have available, the almost instantaneous communication and perhaps over communication <laughs> that comes with the email. The exchange of ideas is much faster. It's not the library anymore that one goes to. <laughs> well, we've run out of time for now. Of course, we're going to continue this discussion in our web extra conversation. You can find that on our website. Go to idahoptv.org. Click on D4K. We'll find out. We have lots more information about the research that's going on about IDEMS. You can find it all at the Dialogue website, idahoptv.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Join us. We'll be a friend on Idaho Public Television, and we'll see you next time here on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Additional funding provided by Idaho National Laboratory, where for 60 years the energy of innovation has lighted the way to progress in energy and national security, basic and applied science and engineering technology, and the education of Idaho's next generation of researchers.